Welcome to the 2019 ADL Austin Jurisprudence Luncheon. I'm Milam Newby, and along with Lisa Kaufman and Gary Zalsmer, serve as co-chair of today's luncheon. It gives me great pleasure to celebrate the work of ADL and to recognize our two distinguished honorees, Speaker Joe Strauss and Martha Dickey. I'm co-chairing this event because of the impact that ADL has in our communities. While this world seems to be focused on politics, ADL is focused on purpose, its purpose to fight hatred, to build communities of respect, and to encourage diversity and inclusion for all people. The work of ADL is needed now more than ever. While this room may look like 500 people at any luncheon in Austin, Texas, it is really extraordinary. It represents people from different political persuasions coming together to celebrate two outstanding individuals and one timeless mission. Your presence exemplifies how ADL brings people together. ADL promotes speaking with each other, not at each other. And ADL, like our honorees, does this every day. Throughout this luncheon, you will learn how. We bring people together to have meaningful conversations, and I look forward to the conversations we'll have today. I would, like now to, I would like to now recognize our sponsors, all of whom are listed in your program. Without your support, this event would not be possible, and even more importantly, the work of ADL would not be possible. We thank all of you for in, your investment in this vital work. Finally, we would also like to thank our incredible steering committee, who worked tirelessly to make today a success, our distinguished honorees, Speaker Strauss and Martha Dickey, and all of you for spending your day with us today. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Reverend Joseph Parker of David Chapel to the podium for the invocation. Please bow with me. God of our weary years and our silent tears, we gather in this place this afternoon recognizing that there is no place for hate anywhere you are present. So gather us as people of justice and mercy and fairness around the common struggles for hope out of despair, freedom out of bondage and love overcoming hate. In these chaotic times draw into peaceful existence a nation which all flourish in harmony, knock down the walls of suspicion and division that contaminate us, contain us, and hurt our communities. Weave your demand of justice and equity into the fabric of our lives. Lift the hindering indifferences hidden in our hearts so we might together raise the banner of your justice and peace for all as we cooperate with you. Help us to see beyond our differences, to discover the common bonds of compassion for all. Let there be dialogue and service and celebration. And when the task of peace, justice, fairness making is too large, and the burden crushing the pain and fright more than we can bear, hold us up on every leaning side and place our feet on solid ground. And in this context, we honor and lift up two living examples, the Honorable Joe Strauss and Attorney Martha Dickey, who urge us by their lives and living to pursue being our better selves. We ask that you will bless the food that we have eaten and will eat. In a public setting such as this, I am readily aware that there are those present who may not pray, others who may pray in names of Yahweh and Allah or Buddha, but I pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you. That was beautiful. Good afternoon. My name is Renee LaFerre, and I have the pleasure of serving as Regional Director of ADL Austin. As I look around the room, I am amazed by the group assembled here. It speaks volumes about our honorees and about the importance of ADL's work. I have four minutes to tell you what ADL does. So, here goes. 
ADL was founded 106 years ago with this mission, to fight the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. Because in the wisdom of our founders, they understood that if everyone does not enjoy justice and fair treatment, we are all at risk. But if you boil it down, ADL fights hate every day. So the next question is, what does hate look like? I want to provide the context, if you will, the 30,000 foot view of what hate is. This is how we look at the world. What you see on these two screens is called the pyramid of hate. This is how it works. The top of the pyramid represents genocide, the act to annihilate an entire people. But you can't get there without going through each of the four layers below it. You cannot have genocide without bias-motivated violence, discrimination, acts of bias, and biased attitudes. When prejudice and small incidents of bias go unchecked at the bottom of the pyramid, when they become unacceptable, they pave the way for more serious and violent acts. The good news is that when you confront the, those lower level behaviors, you interrupt the escalation of hate. Our job at ADL is to keep things as low on that pyramid as possible. So how do we do that? Over 106 years, we have developed a lot of tools to fight hate. A toolbox that we have honed and sharpened and modified over time. The first tool employed by the founding staff of ADL is appeals to reason. Basically, engaging in conversation about the issue at hand. I would say that appeals to reason is still at the core of everything we do. Instead of reading to you what's on the slide, here are some examples. For individual issues, we often send letters and reach out quietly, hoping that we can engage in teachable moments. When there are bigger structural issues, we work on legislation or file amicus briefs. When expertise is needed, we build centers around issues like our Center on Extremism. We've often found that building coalitions and working with community partners are effective tools like the Coalition for the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Bringing No Place for Hate to over 350 Central Texas schools to empower inclusive schools is yet another. One thing that is monumental right now is cyber hate. To counter this, we have developed the Center on Technology and Society and we are developing, deploying tried and true tools as well as completely new ones, like studying if gaming can be structured to grow empathy or how to deploy artificial intelligence to track and counter online hate. When an issue comes across our desk, we strategize on how to best handle it, all in the name of keeping bias really low on that pyramid of hate. So, the takeaway is that we work to stop hate to ensure that we all live in a world that is civil, respectful of differences, and upholds the values of justice and fair treatment. I thank you all for partnering with us in our work. And now I have the distinct honor of recognizing some of our distinguished guests here today. First, we wanna give a shout out to the Travis County Sheriff's Office for providing security. Thank you guys. I would like to thank the over 30 ADL board members who are here today. We could not do our work without you. Okay, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna do the past honorees and then the dignitaries. Can we wait to clap at the end so we can be done on time? We would also like to recognize our past honorees, many of whom are here today. For the Jurisprudence Award, that would be Pete Winstead, Clark Heydrick and Terry Tottenham, and the Trailblazer Award, the first one was the Texas Supreme Court Permanent Judicial Commission for Children, Youth, and Family, and then Sandy Shapiro, Catherine Morse, and Martha Smiley. And now I have the distinct privilege of recognizing the dignitaries who have honored us by their presence. Irish Consul General Adrian Farrell, Mexican Consul General Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, Texas Senators Jose Menendez and Cal Seliger. Texas House Representatives 
Retta Bowers, Craig Goldman, Vicki Goodwin, Donna Howard, Todd Hunter, Kyle Cassell, Eddie Lucio III, Jeannie Morrison, Chris Patty, Dade Phelan, Richard Raymond, Eddie Rodriguez, and Sinfronia Thompson. Western District of Texas judges, Andrew Austin, Mark Lane, Sam Sparks, and Lee Yakel. Texas Supreme Court Justice Paul Green and Supreme Court Justice Jeff Brown. Third Court of Appeals Judges Thomas Baker, Melissa Goodwin, Cherry Kelly, Jeff Rose, Edward Smith, Gisela Triana. Travis County District Court Just Judges Judge Ames Arth, Judge Darlene Byrne, Karen Crump, Maya Guerra Gamble, Scott Jenkins, Laura Livingston, Amy Meacham, and Jan Soifer. Travis County Court at Law Judges, Elizabeth Earl, Brandy Mueller, Eric Shepard, and Todd Wong. Travis County Probate Bud Judges, Guy Herman and Dan Prashner. U.S. Attorney John Bash. Special Agent in Charge, FBI San Antonio Division, Christopher Combs. Assistant Special Agent in Charge, FBI Austin Field Office, John Scada. Texas DPS Chief John Jones, Public Utilities Commissioner Shelley Botkin, Travis County District Attorney Margaret Moore, Mayor Steve Adler, Austin Council Members Greg Kassar, Allison Alter, Ann Kitchen, Pio Renteria, Kathy Tovo, and Jimmy Flanagan. We're almost done. Pflugerville Council Member Rudy Mateer, Chancellor of the Texas State University System Brian McCall, University of Texas President Greg Fenves, AISD Superintendent Paul Cruz, AISD Board President Geronimo Rodriguez, Austin Police Department Chief Brian Manley, and Admiral Bobby Inman. Thank you all so much and wow. Speaker Strauss and Martha, I hope you can tell by the attendance in this room how much this community appreciates you. Now, please turn your attention to the screen for the presentation of our first honoree, Martha Dickey. I think what drives Martha is what drives a lot of lawyers, which is at the end of the day, they want to feel like justice was done. And justice was done in a way that was not just fair to the letter of the law, but fair to the parties who were involved. And so using the law as a tool to make sure that communities are brought together, that people are made whole, uh, and that she and those communities can go home at the end of the day feeling better about the world they live in than they did when they woke up. She is involved in everything. She's a member of everything. Sooner or later, she'll be the president of everything. And Martha's a people person, and so anything that uh, makes, uh, makes things better for people, Martha's gonna be involved. Martha also has a very strong sense of loyalty, and she will fight tooth and nail for people in her community, and I think that's why we all love her so dearly. Martha's personal goals mirror the goals of the ADL. Uh, Martha is inherently about justice and doing the right thing. Uh, Martha was interested in promoting diversity before promoting diversity was cool. So you can say three things about Martha Dickey. She's a problem solver, which if you haven't noticed is uh, not uh, the uh, dominant trait of all lawyers. Uh, she's fearless. And third, uh, she's optimistic. It's not that she doesn't see oppression and dishonesty and corruption. It's that she thinks that there can be something done about it, and she wants to uh, take the lead. And uh, that's the mission of this organization, and it embodies uh, what Martha is in every community that she's involved in. Martha's DNA is wired to serve others. That is what Martha is all about. So Martha is just a natural leader. Uh, when she's asking you to do something, uh, technically the words uh, are formed in the way of uh, a request, but underlying it, you have the definite sense that uh, she expects you to do it and you are going to do it. And so people view her as a leader in that way. But I think the way that she really leads the families and the community that she's a part of is through the force of her example. She knew from a very early age what it meant uh, to be interested in fairness and justice and equality, and she's lived that throughout her life. Being a woman in a male-dominated field has made her passionate about 
uh, people being treated fairly. She has always had a respect for people coming from different backgrounds. Martha, on behalf of the whole family, congratulations, well earned. Martha, this community and this world is a better place because of you and people like you. Congratulations, this is well deserved. Congratulations on being recognized as ADL's trailblazer. Martha, I want to congratulate you and more than anything, I wanna say thank you for all of the years of inspiration. You have blazed a trail to touch, enrich, transform, and inspire countless others over your 39-year legal career. You richly deserve this ADL Trailblazer Award. Thirty-seven years ago, I met Martha Dickey. I was introduced to Martha by my friend Scott Jenkins. I was Judge Nowlin's incoming first law clerk. Martha and Scott were senior Judge Jack Roberts law clerks. After Scott's introduction, Martha took me under her wings, and she taught me how to be a law clerk. When the Fifth Circuit affirmances came rolling in, I was quick to bask in the praise and compliments from Judge Nallen. And when those occasional, resounding, jarring Fifth Circuit reversals occurred, I was equally quick to point out to Judge Nallen that it was all Martha's fault. <laughs> because of Martha, there were a lot more affirmances than reversals. I learned from Martha that being a law clerk wasn't solely about reading cases in a library, but it was about taking to heart and taking into account that there are real people, real parties, with real issues and real problems that need to be resolved with care, with fairness, and with overriding justice. This overwhelming sense of fairness and justice is interwoven in and at the forefront of Martha's DNA. When I think of Martha, when we think of Martha, we gravitate to the word force. Martha Dickey is a force of nature, a force for good, a force for justice, a force for compassion, and a force for making things right and better for all. Martha is a force for standing up and speaking up to do what's right and what's just, no matter what the challenge, no matter what the issue, no matter what the cost, no matter what. Martha embodies the ADL mission of securing justice and fair treatment for all. It is with such great pride and honor that I present Martha Dickey with the 2019 ADL Austin Trailblazer Award. Wow, um, some of that stuff in that video may even be true. Um, it's not part of my speech, but I'm gonna say this anyway. You know, growing up I realized men were leaders and women like me were bossy. And uh, that's not politically correct to say that anymore, but everybody knows it's true. And it's really nice to be getting an award for it, finally. <laughs> My first grade teacher would be so proud. 
I really appreciate my family members, my law firm family out there, my legal family of lawyers and judges that came today, and my large family of friends that showed up because um, they're all a piece of me. Teaching tolerance has really always been at the forefront of my family, um, particularly from my mom, who's here today, who uh, ingrained that in every one of her seven children, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. I'm really honored to receive the Trailblazer Award on the same program with Speaker Strauss, who embodies uh, an ability to strive for tolerance and reach across the aisle to divergent opinions in a time when we don't have enough of that. So it's really an honor for me to be on the program with him today. Um, in thinking about this over the last month, I heard a story. Um, it's not just a story, it's a real fact that the Department of Justice has reported that hate crimes have risen each of the last three years. In 2017, hate crimes rose 17%. That's an astounding figure. And we all know anecdotally that it's probably more than that. ADL is important now more than ever in fighting hate in all its forms in working through justice in all segments of our society. This organization is a voice of reason in often unreasonable times. They promote respect in a disrespectful time and build bridges when our society is becoming more divisive. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate the 500 people that are in this room recognizing that and contributing that to every day and how honored I am to have gotten this award. Thank you so much. Please turn your attention to the screens as we now recognize the Honorable Joe Strauss. When I think of Speaker Strauss, I think of integrity. He loves the state of Texas with deep roots uh, in the state, and he truly believes in the people of Texas. And he is the best example of an elected representative serving, serving the people uh, that he represents. Speaker Strauss has always inspired me with his inclusive and selfless leadership and his focus, his real focus on the problems and issues that affect all of us here in our state, our nation, and us as individuals. He has an innate sense of what priorities are and should be, uh, and that is, uh, in the end, all that really matters is how much you love and how much you give back. He clearly understands that to effectively govern, you've got to find a consensus on issues. Uh, he's not driven by ideology, but rather that trying to get things done and defending individual rights, religious rights, liberty in that process. Speaker Strauss brought a sense, I think, of dignity to the House for one thing. And his focus was on working on the bread and butter issues, the kitchen table issues that make a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of Texans. In today's political environment, there are very few elected officials that you can point to and say they are great role models, or they're great servant leaders, or they're great statesmen. Joe Strauss is one of them. He always puts his principles above partisanship. He was always one of the most thoughtful uh, individuals up in the Capitol. I mean, he clearly was a remarkable leader. Uh, you could sense it not only within the Republican Party and the representatives, but everybody that knows Joe Strauss knows what kind of great leader he is. And watching him on the tough issues uh, around the legislative session, uh, you couldn't help but marvel at that. His ability to read the tea leaves, if you will, and determine what's best for the state in the context of political shifts is really what made him such a core and valued leader at the time when we needed it in Texas. I think when you look at the evolution of the state of Texas during Joe Strauss's tenure, uh, everything about 
where we were and where we are now as a result of his leadership, I think has improved. Certainly I can see it in the world of higher education. I can see it in the world of healthcare. I can see it in the world of how we are supporting uh, the underprivileged. Everything about Texas has improved under Joe Strauss's leadership. Probably what I'm going to remember him most for is the work that he did to staunch discriminatory practices in our state, to make sure that all Texans had the same opportunities, uh, that there was no group of people that would be marginalized. Um, he held firm to that, and I give him a lot of credit for the good things that came out of the legislative sessions and for his efforts to prevent some of the bad. Part of our prosperity is that Texas has a first-rate business climate. That business climate is threatened by le proposed legislation that would focus on purely on social issues. And it was his opposition, uh, steadfast, that kept us from getting a bathroom bill to solve a non-existent problem. He was very clear from the get-go that that was discriminatory, and as he put it, that he did not want to have on his conscience the death of one individual who would be put in a position of feeling discriminated against and taking their own life. I remember going into several um, dinners, luncheons that were held by business community uh, after that legislative session ended when he was able to prevent that bathroom legislation from passing. And he was like a rock star when he walked into those rooms. I mean, there was so much cheering going on because of the gratitude that so many people felt for this one leader standing up and preventing this hurtful, harmful legislation from going forward. I mean, I can't think of a better representation of ADL than that. Speaker Strauss, uh, it has been an honor to know you and work with you. And I offer my sincere congratulations on behalf of myself and the University of Texas. Congratulations. Congratulations, Joe. I can't think of a more deserving person for this important award. You have stood up, you were there, and you can be counted on. Thank you for all that you've done for the state of Texas. We are proud of you and we expect and need your leadership and your wisdom here in the state for years to come. Congratulations. Well done. You have richly earned this honor from the Anti-Defamation League. Joe, let me congratulate you again on receiving the ADL Jurisprudence Award. I can think of nobody, absolutely nobody, who is more deserving of the award. Thank you, Speaker Strauss for giving me all the opportunities you gave me to be the best that I can be, for bringing dignity and respect to our Texas House that we both love so much, and for working for the common good for all Texans. I look forward to when our paths are gonna cross again, and I'm saving a glass for you. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Kaufman, and I have the honor of presenting Speaker Joe Strauss with the Jurisprudence Award. There are these rare people in our community who, in daily work, exhibit true leadership, whose actions are heartwarming and inspiring, and who treats everyone with dignity and respect. The testimonials you just heard in the video underscore Joe's feelings towards inclusion and service, and the values to which ADL stands for every day. As someone who has known and worked for Speaker Strauss for the last 10 years, I have had a front row seat to just see how he personifies these values. With the support of his wonderful wife, Julie, Joe has carried on the tradition of service in his family. Having Joe's parents, Joe and Jossie, and his sister Susan here today makes this award even more special. I'm probably most proud of Joe's demonstrated ability, time and again, in the most difficult of circumstances, to disagree without being disagreeable, not always with me. He is a true statesman who embodies the idea of civility. So it gives me great pleasure on behalf of ADL to present my former boss and my friend, the Honorable Joe Strauss with the Jurisprudence Award.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, for the very nice introduction. Um, and thank you for that, for that really over-the-top video, too. President Finbus, I saw you there um, with your family story. For those of you who have not seen or read the speech he gave about his own family's history and his father's experience during the Holocaust, you really need to. And um, so I'll, I will happily share this award with you. Um, Admiral Inman and Pam Williford and Sandy Gottesman, Chancellor McCall, Admiral McRaven, and Donna Howard, thank you very much for your very kind remarks. And Lisa, somehow I don't recall you ever being that nice to me when we worked together. <laughs> Not really true. Um, but all those nice things that were just said reminds me that that after you say um, you're leaving public office, people become much, much kinder. And if, I, if I'd only known that, I would have left a long time ago. Uh, but when I first came, became speaker after only two terms in the Texas House, I knew that I had to surround myself with people who I could trust, people who the members could trust. And I had that staff, and I had that support all the way through. Nobody played a more important role on my team the first, than um, Lisa Kaufman did in the first couple of sessions. She was not only a trusted advisor, but obviously a very cherished friend that she is today. Um, now, I'm proud of the fact, as I spent some time in the reception before this lunch, proud of the fact that many of my senior advisors and chiefs of staff over the years in the speaker's office were women. So Denise, Lisa, Jennifer, Commissioner Shelley Botkin. Um, I mean, Jesse's here too, you were all right. Um, but I have always been, always, always been surrounded by really smart and really um, strong women. And I mean always. Obviously, my mother, Jossie, was the first. And I'm really, really happy that she's here today. And uh, obviously, my most important advisor from uh, my public service career, and obviously before, and today, is my wife, Julie. And I'm delighted that she is here. And, and if it's true, as I suspect it is, that you really just invited me here today so that you could get Julie back to Austin, I can't blame you a bit. But I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank all the hosts and the organizers who've made this event possible. It's been a while since I've had the chance to address as many people. There's one thing I remember from the days when I used to give a lot more big speeches than I do today, and that's to always be brief. That's especially true now since there's no reason for most of you to be kind to me anymore. <laughs> but um, it's especially true today when we have a real star like Mark Updegrove, who's about to take the stage in a moment. Uh, but I do want you to know that, that in all sincerity that I am extremely, extremely grateful to um, receive this award. And I'm honored because I appreciate the value of the work that ADL does and the high regard in which many Texans have for your work. Any success that I enjoyed as Speaker of the House was really a reflection of the commitment and the hard work of my House colleagues. And so, um, well, I, I got a lot of the credit, and as you may have noticed, a fair amount of the blame from time to time. I couldn't have stayed Speaker for five terms without the strong support and a great group of colleagues, and I'm honored that several of them are here today. As I continue my service to the state of Texas from the private side now, I want to keep working with ADL and I want to keep working with all of you. Your mission, your efforts to confront and erase bigotry and discrimination in our society could not be more important. You heard the statistics, they're alarming. ADL is needed now more than ever. The ADL and its supporters work tirelessly to promote justice, inclusiveness, and most of all, a better future for all of our children. 
So often this group stands up for those who have no voice and who need a voice the most. In moments of suffering, ADL provides hope. In moments of conflict, ADL provides moral clarity. And by supporting ADL, you are supporting what's truly best about the state of Texas. So I'm proud to stand with you in that effort, and I'm grateful, truly grateful, to receive this award. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Speaker Strauss. <clears throat> I'm Jared Lindauer. I'm the current board chair of Austin ADL. Right off the bat, thank you. It's good to have fans. I want to thank the incredible chairs. Uh, they've done an unbelievable job uh, with the event today, so thank you very much. I also want to thank Speaker Strauss and Martha Dickey for allowing us to honor you today. You've embodied the mission of the ADL in your roles as advocates and public servants, and these honors are truly richly deserved. We, the legal community, have a special role in the fight against hate. Justice and equality are pillars of our profession. Pursuit of those ideals is why I went to law school. It's a, uh, I'm thankful for ADL because they have given me a way to pursue those ideals in our community, a way for me to help build a better world. Since our last jurisprudence luncheon, the mission of the ADL, in short, to build a world without hate, has grown harder and tremendously more important as we've seen an unprecedented rise in hate. The Center on Extremism, ADL's research and investigative arm, has been tracking domestic extremist attacks for over 50 years. Six of the 10 deadliest attacks during that time have occurred in the past four years. For the Jewish community, the rise in hate has meant open anti-Semitism, the likes of which has not been seen in my lifetime. What began with audaciously outspoken bigots was followed by increasing acts of vandalism, which was followed by tiki torch marches with Americans chanting, Jews will not replace us, followed by the deadliest act of violence against the American Jewish community in our history, when a man opened fire on a congregation that was gathered for prayer at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. At the ADL, we know that this shocking act of violence did not happen in a vacuum. Here was a man emboldened by the extremist community that he found online, activated by his intense fears of Latin American refugees seeking protection in our country, and motivated by extremist ideologies that were learned as an adult and extended well beyond anti-Semitism. At the ADL, we also know that this rise in hate is not limited to the Jewish community. We've seen similar rises in every other kind of bigotry you can imagine. In fact, the very same week as the Tree of Life shooting, a man attempted to gain entry into a historically black church in Kentucky, presumably to carry out a similar attack. When he failed, he opened fire at a local Walmart killing two African-American shoppers, allegedly shouting at one point, whites don't shoot whites. The ADL has always fought for justice and fair treatment for everyone because the ADL knows that the hate that motivates anti-Semitism in Pittsburgh is the same hate that motivates racism in Kentucky and Charleston, that motivates the hate we saw in Charlottesville and Parkland and San Bernardino in Orlando or even here in Austin. The ADL has always fought for justice and fair treatment for everyone because the ADL knows that none of us will be free from hate until we are all free from hate. Combating extremism and building a world without hate both begin with education. The vast majority of extremists learn that ideology outside the home. And so the ADL has extensive educational programs reaching hundreds of thousands of Austin area students every year to ensure we reach those children before extremists do, to ensure that the next generation will be effective allies against hate. We cannot stop extremists if we don't understand them. The ADL Center on Extremism tracks extremists of all types around the world, regularly works with law enforcement, and has helped disrupt and prevent multiple terror attacks. The internet, 
we know is ground zero for, for the fight against hate. The ADL leads that fight as it has for the past two decades, working with the likes of Google and Facebook and Twitter to ensure that the internet is not turned into a megaphone for hatred and that extremists and bigots do not find refuge online. Hate may be on the rise, but now is not the time to despair. Now is the time for us to stand together as a community. I know that we can still build a world without hate, one where America recognizes that its greatest strength is its diversity. But I also know that we will only get there if we are united, if we are fighting for each other, and the ADL is here to lead the charge. What you've heard about today is just the tip of the iceberg about what ADL is doing locally and nationally. All of this work, all of the work that the ADL does begins exactly the same way. Someone believing in our mission, believing in our work, and donating money to make it possible. Today, I am here to ask you to join the fight and be the one that ensures that the ADL has the resources necessary to stem the rising tide of extremism and continue the fight for justice and fair treatment for everyone. I know that many of you have already given generously and I thank you. For those that have not had the opportunity to give or have the capacity to give more, I'm here to ask you to join us. You'll see on the screen information about how you can donate today uh, through your cell phone. If you would prefer to give a check or in person, there are envelopes in each of your programs. You can fill those out and place them in the middle of the folder at the center of your table. And if you aren't getting wi uh, cellular service, you're not alone. <laughs> so we have some Wi-Fi information to make sure that you have the connectivity you need to donate today. So while you're working on donating, I think in a minute we're going to be able to see uh, what's been given so far and where we're headed. While you're working on donating, I want to take a moment. Oh, there we are. While you're working on donating, I want to take a moment to recognize our incredible local ADL staff. Renee LaFair, Lisa Humphrey, Jillian Bonke, Angela Atlas, and Yael Brown. They are the engine behind all of the great work that ADL does in our community, and we are lucky to have such a talented team. So I want to give all of you plenty of time to give. While you, uh, in just a minute, I'm going to introduce the final panel. I want to let you know that you'll be able to give through the end of the program. And at the end, Renee will be able to come up and let us know where we are. But you guys are doing a great job so far. So we'd like to introduce the final portion of our program, Reflections on Leadership, where Mark Updegrove will lead a conversation with Speaker Strauss. Mark serves as the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. Prior to this, Mark served as the director of the LBJ Library. In both roles, Mark has highlighted the civil rights milestones of LBJ. On the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, Mark conceived of and hosted the Civil Rights Summit which included addresses by then-President Barack Obama and former Presidents Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush. We are honored that he will be moderating this conversation. I welcome you both to the stage. Well, congratulations to Martha Dickey and to uh, uh, you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We have room for one more chair, Martha. <laughs> uh, and uh, to the ADL, thank you for all the good work you do in our city, in our state, and in our nation. And Joe, thank you for the good work you did in the legislature for 14 years. Must have felt like long years at times. What are you going to miss most about the job of Speaker of the House of Representatives? Well, she's sitting at our table. I don't mean Julie, but... Um, 
<clears throat> okay, I won't embarrass her. <laughs> All right, Rebecca. Rebecca, our, who took such great care of Julie and me and our family and our friends, um, she makes the world's best waffles. <laughs> uh, so I miss Rebecca and I miss those waffles a lot. Now, I miss, I'll miss some of the people. I mean, I miss, shouldn't say some. I'll miss the people. Um, <laughs> uh, but, it's, but it's good. I mean, people say that I'm smiling a lot more now and seem more relaxed. But I, I um, you know, I, I had my time in the house a lot of times, seven terms, five of those seven privileged to be the presiding officer there. And I think that was certainly long enough in that job. But um, so I don't. I knew it was the right time for me to go, to move on to other things, and I'm excited about the future. Admiral McRaven talked in his tribute to you about the evolution of Texas politics. In the 14 years that you were in the legislature, how do, would you characterize the evolution of Texas politics? Well, a lot of it was over time reaction to national politics, and I think it still is today. Um, when I was elected speaker, in 2009, um, that was the year that Barack Obama had been elected president, or 2008 election in the 2009 session. And <clears throat> the Republican majority, which was recently, was fairly, a fairly recent uh, phenomenon, um, occurrence, almost went away, almost evaporated, uh, to the fact, to the point that we had 76 Republicans and 74 Democrats. And it was a very um, kind of volatile time politically. Um, very balanced, obviously, almost an even tie. The very next cycle, there was this reaction in the off um, presidential year cycle that added what became a super majority of Republicans. Mm. And so, you know, we kind of careened to the, to the right. And um, even to the, to the time that I uh, departed there were 95 Republicans in the House and 55 Democrats. Well, this recent election evened things up a good bit. So I think a lot of, a lot of the politics was reactive to what was happening nationally, and it filtered down uh, to Texas legislative districts. The politics, not just the elections, but the politics followed that. And so you saw in 2009, probably my, my most fond memory, um, and I've considered it something of an accomplishment, was we passed a state budget in the Texas House with 76 Republicans and 74 Democrats. Actually, Edmund Kempel wasn't there, so it was 75-74. We passed our, our, um, our state budget that year 149 to zero. So it was, you know, having that close divide kind of forced us to work together, and it was a good thing. The, the mission, one of the missions of this organization is uh, to have people talk with each other and not at each other. If you look at the, uh, the, the lawmakers under the Capitol Dome, are more of them talking with each other or at each other? Well, more are talking with each other today than where I left things. Um, <clears throat> I think the voters spoke up in this recent election, scared the heck out of a lot of people who didn't see a close race coming. Um, I see some members who I left behind who are um, on a much different agenda than they were last session. And that's a good thing. I think they're beginning to really focus on the bread and butter issues of the state of Texas. Um, I think our politics in the state capitol are improving. I'm glad to see everybody getting along. I hope it lasts. And I think they're, I think they're gonna do some really important, good, strong work in public education. Um, so I, I'm encouraged. Uh, the last few sessions, there were some pretty volatile, divisive, um, even discriminatory issues that gained a lot of traction. Um, and I'm glad to see that they're not, no longer front and center. So, what, do you, what do you most want to see come out of this legislative session? I want to see this, what I believe is a once in a generation opportunity to truly reform our school finance system and to make some long overdue. <laughs> and I, I think um, my Former colleagues, are, many of them are in the Capitol today having a press conference on the House side um, with Chairman Huberty's um, school finance bill. Um, Speaker Bonin has given him very strong support and been very clear in his direction. 
And I'm very encouraged that they're about to do something really positive, long overdue, and necessary to the future of the state of Texas in passing a really good, substantive, um, strongly supportive of public education and educators bill in, in um, the House bill that's been um, introduced today. And what does that look like, Joe? What, is, what, is the, what are the effects well, of a bill like that? The effects of the bill are, um, it's, it's going to be a big, complicated bill. It's going to have a lot of impact in the classrooms. It's going to make, um, it's going to make most of our school districts, if not almost all of them, in a better financial uh, position than they are today. It's going to begin to take um, a serious bite out of the Robin Hood system that has, been, that has grown completely out of control since it was first um, initiated, felt nowhere more strongly than it is here in Austin. Um, and I believe that the, that the House bill with $9 billion going toward schools and to buying down property taxes <clears throat> is going to be a really important thing um, to taxpayers. But more importantly, it's going to be a very important thing to the school children and to educators, getting money into the classroom, um, supporting um, House bill supports uh, full day pre-K, not with a grant program that's been discussed and instituted in the last few years, but with a really permanent, important, um, lasting um, full day pre-K program for those kids who qualify for it. Um, and it. And it's avoiding some of the pitfalls that I thought might sneak their way into this bill. You know, there's a lot of talk about high stakes testing. My understanding is that the House bill is kind of avoiding some of the problems that we have um, been reading about in terms of whether those tests given to eight-year-olds are really uh, appropriate for them. So I think, it's, I think it's a bill that almost everybody in the legislature can support. And I'm going to be out there um, doing what I can from the private side, uh, cheering them on. What would be your secondary priority? <clears throat> this session? Yeah. You know, I think, um, I, I always think that the most important issues are to support public education, as I just spoke about. But supporting public ed education is the most important economic development tool that we have. And we haven't done enough in recent years. Um, going back to 2011, we, we made a, a cut, which was unthinkable but we had a $20 billion shortfall. Um, we've been trying to recover from that ever since, and this is the first time we can actually get ahead. So clearly public education is, is job number one of the legislature. But we have other issues too. Um, high, we have leaders of higher education here. Chancellor McCall um, is here, and President Fenves and others. Higher education is absolutely essential to improving the quality of life in Texas. And so I, wanna, I want to, um, Always keep our eye on, on those balls for sure. There's others, there's infrastructure, making sure that we have an adequate supply of clean water in the state, uh, making sure that we have smart transportation policy. And um, so I think just you know, bread and butter issues that are really the challenges for a fast growing state. I don't wanna leave uh, today without commending to you all and recommending to you all that you check out a really important project that's being led out of Dallas by um, a really phenomenal individual named Tom Luce. Um, his program is called 20, Texas 2036. I want you to go to their website and I want you to support his efforts. He, he is putting together and has put together a very thoughtful, long-term strategic approach to tackling the, the fundamental issues that face the state of Texas um, between now and 2036, which is our bicentennial. Um, by 2036, Texas is going to have 6 million new jobs as our population increases. Virtually every one of those jobs is going to require an educational attainment beyond high school, some sort of a certificate beyond high school, either a two-year or four-year degree. And so this is a thoughtful, long-term roadmap to getting there. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be out hopefully supporting, um, supporting his agenda and supporting that long-term visionary work, and I hope that you all will too. The, the, the population in this state is evolving as well, um, and the composition is, is changing. How does the Republican Party need to evolve to remain viable and to remain dominant 
in the state of Texas? Well, it needs to start solving problems. It needs to get off the, it needs to get off the divisive social issues, which I'm optimistic there seems to be. We seem to be getting away from that now and on to real problem solving. So I'm, I'm really optimistic, but that's what we need to do. Um, I think there was a, a, a wake up call in this last election. The area where my mother and others um, of her vintage, where they built the Republican Party in the suburbs of Texas. The suburbs were a real weak spot in this last election. And that should be a real scary wake up call for Republicans. Uh, it's, where, it's where we came from. And we need to go back and concentrate not on scaring people, not leading with all these divisive issues that are built on fear, but on bread and butter, education, higher education, infrastructure, making life better, giving people more opportunities to prosper um, and to move the state forward. So many of us had deep admiration for you before the bathroom bill <laughs> and your, your stand. Um, but our, our admiration deepened further when you, uh, when you took that stand. What was your thinking when, when that bill came up? And I, I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, were you thinking about your political future as you waged that battle? When you're a Speaker of the House, you have no political future. <laughs> so, no, I am. Um, it's part of the reason I left. But, <laughs> but I... Uh, so no, I mean, I really didn't think about my political future. I really never gave any thought to bathroom policies. I mean, come on. I mean, it's not the most, I didn't think it was a serious issue until someone made it that, called it the civil rights or the most important issue of our time or something ridiculous. And so I didn't see others, I didn't see others stepping in to, to defeat it. And I came to it first really as a business and economic issue. And I saw the reports that um, it could be very damaging to our state's reputation as a job creator and a business-friendly state. That got my attention. But the more I tuned into the debate and I saw the, I saw the families come and the young people um, who were testifying, and they were saying these things, it really got my attention and made it, made it clear to me that it was much more than just an economic, um, more than an economic issue. It was a it was a, a real, um, just mean-spirited debate. It was a non-issue, really, when you talk to people. They're, I've never heard of any problems occurring in a bathroom that you know, were related to what this was supposed to solve. So um, it became more of a, of a human uh, decency issue to me. And um, you know, I just didn't, I didn't think it was necessary. I thought it was harmful. And I could hear the pleas of families and young people um, who, were, who were to be affected by it. Discrimination has no place in politics. And, and, and I, was, um, I was proud to, to lead the opposition on that. Were you surprised at the reaction you got? I was a little bit, yes. Um, you know, at first, at first, I was speaking out against it, against that bill, and there wasn't a whole lot behind me. I knew the business, I knew the business community didn't want to see it happen, but they weren't particularly vocal at first. And I want to give um, a lot of credit to my political and to my house team uh, for really working hard to pull that coalition together. And over time, with the leadership of certain uh, business executives, and I'd point out Randall Stevenson as one who really stood up strongly in Dallas uh, in the summer when the special session came along. That issue was um, placed on the call by the governor as a very important issue to him. And um, when Randall Stevenson stood up and others in the Dallas community and then others in Houston and San Antonio and around the state, uh, faith leaders, law enforcement leaders, educators, it was very clear um, that that we had the force of public opinion on our side. Right. We did, and we prevailed. Right. We're, we're, uh, Martha Dickey mentioned that there is a, uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Martha Dickey mentioned that there has been a 17% spike in hate crimes. We're living in a time when the climate is more conducive 
to racism and anti-Semitism, it seems. Those, those people who hate have been emboldened. What do we do to alleviate that? Well, I think the change has to come from the bottom up, not from the top down. Clearly isn't going to happen from the top down, it doesn't occur to me. Um, is that clear enough? <laughs> um, but it's a serious problem. It's a serious problem when national leaders are stoking, um, stoking fear and resentment in politics. So I think people are going to have to stand up and speak up. And they are. I think they are. We have an election coming up in a couple of years, and I think the correction will continue. Um, but I believe in the innate goodness of most people. I believe in the innate, innate goodness of Texans. And I know we're going to get it right. I think this is a period we're going through where I worry a lot about, about the lack of faith that citizens have in their institutions. That is the underpinning of our democracy. It's the most fundamental weakness that we face right now. Long term, I'm optimistic. Short term, it's going to be a little bumpy, I think. But civic engagement, getting more people involved in the process, getting more young emerging leaders identified to step up, I think we'll all be part of correcting um, the unfortunate situation that we're in right now. How do you get people more engaged when there is such a high level of cynicism? Education. Absolutely. Everything, everything that will help our society, help our economy, and make us a better people starts with education. And so that's, again, I think... <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you get to the core and that was up on the slides, the, the core problem with discrimination and with, with fear is it all, it all revolves um, around, um, it, just, it just all revolves around people um, not knowing better, mm. not being educated. And um, so I think you can't start early enough. That's why I think this pre-K program uh, that they're working on the legislature can be very, very valuable going forward. What is the greatest lesson you took from being Speaker of the House of Representatives? Oh, it wasn't a lesson I didn't already know. And that's that you have to work with people. You have to keep a sense of humor. You have to, you have to remain humble. And if, you, if you're not humble, try having two young daughters who don't give a hoot about politics <laughs> around the house. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I didn't really learn a lot of lessons. I was able to have lessons I already knew reinforced. And it's all, politics is a people business, and I loved it. Um, I love serving in the House. Not every day, but I love serving in the House. And I did it for a long time, and I was very fortunate to do that, and now I'm looking forward to other things. So what does the future hold for Joe Strauss? Well, I'll be home tonight, <laughs> um, which is a good start. Uh, but beyond tonight, um, you know, I get asked that question a lot. And, um, you know, I, I, have, I have some plans for the future. I'm, I'm going to keep my political team together. I have my campaign uh, organization still active. Um, I'll at some point have a, have a more robust operation. I'm staying in touch with people who have supported me very generously and have backed me through my time in the legislature. I stay in touch with them. I'll have an opportunity this, in the last 80 days of this session not being bogged down here, um, dealing with the details of House bill whatever, or Senate bill whatever. Uh, and I'll be free to travel and to speak out on issues that I think are important and support those who I think are doing the right thing, who have beliefs like we do. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stay engaged. And you know, I, love, I love public service. I love politics. And uh, I love the state of Texas. So I'll be working on many of the issues that I worked on uh, in my public life. If there were an office one could entice you in running for. <laughs> what would that office be? Well, I live in Terrell Hills, Texas, and we have a mayor who's doing a very fine job, so I'm going to rule that one out. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have sites set on a, on a public office, and I really do believe, and I said this when I announced I wasn't running again um, after five terms as speaker, I really believe that private citizens can help move the needle and engage in the debate. Um, and I mean, it doesn't hurt that I have the experience and the perspective that I've had from the platform 
that I've had recently. But I believe I can still engage in the debate from the private side. And if there's some future public service down the road, it, it will reveal itself. Uh, but I don't have plans today. Um, but I will stay engaged. Well, Mr. Speaker, we look forward to hearing what your next act holds. We congratulate you on this well-deserved award. And we thank you for your many years of, of public service and for your political courage. Thank Ladies you Ladies and gentlemen, much. Joe Strauss. Thank you. <laughs> can, we, can we beat the time? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I get the official job of, first of all, thanking you all for coming and for supporting our work. We put the thermometer back up. Don't be shy. Um, text 91999 with your the name word Austin, the amount in your name. It will be up all day and all night if you're interested. We really appreciate it. We could not do this work without you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to our co-chairs and everybody for coming. And at 109, I officially call this jurisprudence to a close six minutes early. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>